you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs, let us know how you feel about it. He you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to part two of diastolic heart function. Hopefully you've had a couple weeks at this point to recover from your diastology induced coma and you're back. So we're here with the echo master today, the only emergency medicine physician dumb enough to have taken and passed the cardiology echo boards, Dr. Mike Mallon. Now some of you may be saying, wait a second, that sounds pretty smart if he took and passed the echo cardiology boards, but no. Absolutely not. You have got to be insane to take that test. And his taking the test is proof of his insanity, regardless of whether or not he passed it. But no matter how crazy he is, I think we probably can learn some echo from him. Go some examples and make us smarter. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Emergency Ultrasound Podcast. I want to do a quick review on what we learned last week on diastology and the uh, evaluation of the diastolic function of the left ventricle. So welcome back to EUP. We're going to do this a little different. We're going to do it with pen and paper this time because I know this stuff gets pretty confusing. So we're going to talk about diastology. We learned last time that congestive heart failure is really important. And it's important for a lot of reasons. It causes a lot of money, requires a lot of admissions, and it causes a lot of morbidity. And we learned that about 50% of all congestive heart failure is diastolic. So that tells me that diastolic is pretty important. So we need to understand how to diagnose this in the emergency department. We also learned something sort of interesting. We learned that diastolic function is related to the preload to the left side of the heart. So the preload to the left ventricle, which is important because when we talk about IVC, we're really talking about the preload to the right side of the heart. And if somebody has something that's preventing flow from getting to the right, from the right side of their heart to the left side of their heart, like, for example, right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolus, acute right ventricular MI, your preload to your LV and your preload to your RV are not quite the same. So this is telling us that possibly we can use diastolic function to evaluate patients uh, and evaluate their preload even if they've got right heart abnormalities or pulmonary abnormalities. So this tells me that diastolic function is pretty important, right? Now, let's go over real quick again how we're going di to diagnose the severity of diastolic dysfunction. There are two things we're going to do. We're going to look at the mitral valve inflow, or MVI, and we're going to look at the tissue Doppler, or TDI. And those are the two different things that are going to help us differentiate between the different patterns of uh, diastolic dysfunction. So, there's four different patterns that you need to know. And the four different patterns are normal, impaired relaxation, pseudonormal, and restrictive. So for the mitral valve inflow, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the apical four-chamber view of the heart. And when we do that, we get an image that looks something like this. What I'm going to do is use pulse wave Doppler, and I'm going to put the gate of my pulse wave signal right at the tips of the mitral valve leaflets. Okay? And what I get in a normal person is I get an E wave and an A wave. Okay? And that's, what, that's the velocity of blood cells that go into the left ventricle during early filling and the atrial kick. If a patient has impaired relaxation, then I'm going to get a smaller E and a bigger A. If a patient has pseudonormal, it goes back to looking like a big A, or excuse me, a big E, and a smaller A. And then with restrictive, you get this real big sharp E and a little tiny or no A. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, how do I differentiate normal and pseudonormal? And the trick to that is using tissue Doppler imaging. So TDI is basically just pulse wave Doppler with a fancy name. And what we're going to do is we're going to put that pulse wave gate right over the mitral valve annulus. So now I'm looking at the velocity of, of the muscle of the heart tissue as it descends during diastole. 
So during diastole, this ventricle has to fill. So when it fills, this part of the muscle has to go downward. So we're me measuring the velocity downward during the diastolic filling phase. And what I get is I get an inverse velocity, so the velocity is going this way, right? And the E prime is going to be big bigger than the A prime, and it's going to be greater than 8. In impaired, that E prime starts to get smaller. It'll be around the size of the A prime, or maybe a little bit smaller. In pseudonormal, the E prime is even smaller, often smaller than the A prime. And in restrictive, the E prime is virtually non-existent because there's hardly any movement of the myocardium during diastole. So in all of these examples, because of the uh, decreased compliance and impaired relaxation of the muscle, your E prime velocity is going to be less than 8 centimeters per second. And that tells me there is abnormal diastolic function. The last thing that I'm going to tell you is that the velocity of this E over the velocity of this E, or E over E prime, is pretty much equal to your left ventricular end diastolic pressure, also known as your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So that's just one more way that we can use echocardiography in place of a Swan-Gans catheter to get some of the same information we're used to seeing. With that being said, let's get back to part two of our diastology lecture and see if we can't learn a little bit more and get some case presentations going. All right. It's fascinating. Yeah, I can tell. So here we are with diastolic dysfunction classification. So now we're looking at normal here, uh, normal relax, uh, relaxation deficit or impaired relaxation, and then pseudonormal is the third uh, row up on the top, and then restrictive is the fourth row up on the top. Uh, so mitral valve flow. Uh, uh, here appears to show that um, E is greater than A in normal diastolic function, E is less than A in relaxation deficit, E is greater than A again in pseudonormal, which is where we need to use that TDI to tell the difference, and then in restrictive, E is like ginormous and A is super tiny, and that's typically how people sort of determine whether somebody has restrictive filling or not. I actually had a guy last night who had restrictive filling uh, in the emergency department, which was totally awesome. Got him admitted to, uh, to the medicine service for heart failure, so I totally use this. So did he not seem like heart failure before? No, he didn't really. I thought he was pneumonia at first. Huh. That's how he kind of presented. Because he didn't really have he didn't really have JVD and he didn't really have um, lower extremity edema, um, which I guess really doesn't help me much anyway because it's only 30% sensitive. But in any case, at first I thought he was I thought he was infectious or something. But it's uh, impossible to have pneumonia and yeah, that doesn't ever happen. <laughs> he might have actually had pneumonia. I don't know. No, I guess you. Get, I mean, you got a chest X-ray and it was. Yeah, and then I CT'd his head, his chest, and his belly. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so moving on. All right, so here's my little graph. Uh, basically showing us the same thing. E, e greater than A is normal. E less than A is impaired relaxation. E so greater than A can be sorry, pseudonormal. Sorry, I have a again. question about that patient. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you called the uh, hospitalist to admit that patient, did you tell them that he had rest restrictive... Uh, I did. Yeah. Yeah. What did they say? I don't think he knew what I was talking about. Okay, yeah. That's what I was thinking. I think I was just thinking this may be a great way to get patients admitted to talk about some stuff that you're pretty sure they won't know what you're talking about. I try to do that as much argue. as possible just so they don't argue with me. Oh, that's great. Yeah, now I like actually am excited to learn this. <laughs> All right. I've got a reason to pay attention now. Okay, continue. All right, so burn this into your mind. Is it burnt? Mm-hmm. All burnt. right, good. Good and burnt. So, uh, talking about it uh, briefly here, so normal diastology, we already said E is greater than A for your mitral valve inflow. Uh, your E prime should be greater than your A prime, and uh, if you did take your big E and divide it by your E prime, that should be less than 15. It turns out, Matt, that that big E divided by E prime is actually your pulmonary wedge pressure. That is a very close correlate to your pulmonary wedge pressure. pressure. So, you can almost just, if you could measure your E and your E prime, sort of, take those two numbers, divide them, and then voila, you've got something that typically would have required uh, invasive procedure and a lot of hustle and bustle and nurses being mad at you and <laughs> all kind of complicated things, blowing up balloons and doing calculations and all this craziness. Now we can just get it in like two minutes. Yeah, I it's hate bustle. Awesome. You hate what? Bustle. You said hustle and bustle. I don't like bustle. 
So here's an example of normal diastology. Uh, so here we're uh, on the left, we're looking at mitral valve inflow. So I've got the gate right in my mitral valve leaflets and I'm measuring the velocity of blood flow in. You can see the E is greater than the A. It's about two than the A. And then on the right, we see our tissue Doppler imaging. On this one, E prime is, uh, is greater than A prime. Uh, you can see here that first uh, up on top is the E prime and then second is A prime. Uh, and we can tell that your E prime is around 10 and your A prime is around eight, which both are normal. So if I did this one, for example, the big E is around 50 and the E prime is around 10. So what's my wedge pressure? Uh, 10, five. <laughs> <laughs> what, was the, what was the equation again? Just E prime divided by... E divided by E prime. E, okay. So wedge pressure divided is... divided by 10. No, no, no. no. 50 divided by 10. Uh, it's pretty complicated. Yeah, Come on. Let me get on my calculator. 55. Genius. Genius. All right. So impaired relaxation is the next step. So when you go from normal to impaired relaxation, there's no going back. Once you've got impaired relaxation, that means your muscles don't relax normally. Your muscles aren't going to all of a sudden start relaxing normally. So once you get to this point on the spectrum, you're stuck on this point forever. Okay. Or you're going to go forward and get worse. So it makes sense. Once you're no longer normal, you're never normal again. <laughs> okay. So, uh, normal compliance, Abnormal relaxation, which just means that the atrium has to work a little bit better to help get all that blood flow in. So your E velocity stays the same, but your A velocity increases. So now your E is less than your A. So E divided by A is less than one, okay? Your filling pressures in a patient with impaired relaxation are st still normal though. So that patient that I admitted last night with restrictive heart failure, once they diurese him and get all that volume off of him, he's going to go back to impaired relaxation. He's not going to go back to normal, okay? So his, his echo will actually change over time, which is one of the cool things about this because we can follow the heart failure patients and see how has the preload to their left ventricle changed. Have we diuresed them enough? And enough would be back to impaired relaxation. Does this following them, does that affect, affect management? It, it would, yeah. So if you were trying to diurese them and their kidneys could take it and they, you haven't gotten them back down to impaired relaxation yet, then you would probably want to continue to diurese them until you got them back down to impaired relaxation. And even if their kidneys were kind of borderline, this would give you a gauge to tell whether or not you should keep pushing or if you could say kind of enough. Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of an inpatient decision. Uh, right, right, right. But I mean, that's more for the cardiologist than for us. We just got to make the diagnosis. We don't have to think that hard. Okay. So impure relaxation, here's an example. On the left side is our pulmonary, uh, or is our, excuse me, our mitral valve inflow showing the E less than the A. And then on the right side is our TDI, which shows our E prime less than our A prime. And this is an example of impaired relaxation. Pseudonormal is the next step on the spectrum. So this is when your left ventricular end diastolic pressure starts increasing. That means this is when your preload to your left heart is high. These are the patients that are going to start having pulmonary edema. These are the patients that have too much volume on board and need to be diuresed. Okay? So uh, usually what you see is your E velocity is greater than your A velocity. Your E velocity is usually pretty high at like 100 centimeters per second. And your E over E prime is going to be greater than 15, right? Because your pulmonary wedge pressure is basically your left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Both are preload to the left heart. It's going to be high. They've got pulmonary edema. They've got blood flow back up. Here's an example of pseudonormal. Pseudonormal shows the E is greater than the A, right? Because we're back to that normal appearing uh, mitral valve inflow, and then we have to go to our TDI to figure out what's what. And the TDI shows the E prime is now 5.6. It's low, it's less than eight, and it's less than your A prime. So in this patient, we've got a normal mitral valve inflow, but we've got an abnormal TDI. So that's pseudonormal diastolic function. The last step on the spectrum is restrictive. Restrictive is bad. Restrictive people do not do well. Uh, they have a very decreased life expectancy. Their heart's uh, very volume overloaded. And once you can get yourself too restrictive, uh, you know things are bad and you need a lot of cardiology management. So these patients have an extremely high left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Their pulmonary wedge pressure is probably going to be greater than 25. Their E velocities are really high, like 150. And their A waves are tiny on their mitral valve inflow. Here's an example of a patient with restrictive. 
you can see their mitral valve inflow here, they barely even have an A wave. So on the left side there is mitral valve inflow, and that wave that you're seeing is pretty much just the E wave. It's really high, it's 100 and looks like 140 there, and, uh, and there's no A wave to be seen. The TDI shows basically virtually no movement of the base. So the velocities are like less than five, those, that E prime looks like it's probably like two centimeters per second, which is way lower than eight. And your E over E prime in this patient would be 140 divided by, say, two. What's that, Matt? 70. Good job. So that's probably a pulmonary wedge pressure of 70, which is pretty astronomical. Seems high. Yeah. That's, I think that's probably higher than their mean arterial pressure, which is, I think that's incompatible with life. Is that right? So here's the spectrum. So the spectrum is uh, the reason this is awesome. The spectrum it basically says that if you're on the left, you're normal, okay? I don't need to worry about you. I can bang you with fluid and not be concerned at all because your heart is so malleable, it's so, uh, it so easily relaxes and it's so compliant that you're going to respond well to that fluid, okay? Whereas patients on the right side of the spectrum are not going to respond well to fluid. In fact, if they're already on the right side, chances are they've got too much fluid on board already because it's telling me their preload is super high to their left ventricle, right? So this becomes important, Matt, when we're talking not only about our heart failure patients, but when we're talking about what do we do next in the septic patients, the hypotensive patients with bad hearts. Those are the ones that die, right? I mean, people that come in with urosepsis that have our baseline congestive heart failure, those are the patients that are really challenging to manage. It's not the septic patients that are 30 with a good heart. Like those people, I mean, rivers works. You bang them with fluid. You wash their CVP when they get to a certain point. You know, you, you stick in a, you stick in a, a, a central line, you start them on pressors if need be, you uh, give them blood, what, whatever Rivers is telling you to do, it's fairly, it's fairly protocolized and it definitely works. But I think where Rivers falls short is in these really sick, sick patients, the ones where we really need to sort of evaluate their heart function a lot better and really understand what the preload is to their left ventricle. So when I, always, when I say their IVC collapses less than 50%, they won't respond to fluid. If it collapses more than 50%, it will. This is why you always roll your eyes when I say that, right? Because it's more complicated. Uh, but how often will, I mean, how often will that not work? I mean, is that... So I, I wouldn't say that the IVC collapsing is probably okay, all right? So a patient who, a patient who is really, uh, who has heart failure, the, the, the complicating thing is their IVC is always going to be big. Okay. Okay. So when you're rolling your eyes, it's more about when I'm talking about the size, not the collapsibility. <laughs> I'm I'm just rolling my eyes at you and John. Oh, okay. Right. It's it's more I'm of a general thing. So I think you can you can pretty much hang your hat on when the IVC is collapsible, you give the patient fluid. You give them a fluid bolus and see how they respond, right? The patients that I'm more interested in are the patients who have a bigger IVC and I want to know do I need to give them pressors? Should I continue trying fluids? Because it's not always just clear based on your IVC, right? I mean, you give them some pressors and you keep going with the pressors and they're not responding, they're not responding, you're thinking, well maybe I should give them fluid, right? The, the question for me more becomes, at what point do I start dobutamine on these patients? At what point do I try to push their heart a little bit more? Uh, at what point do I stop giving them fluid? And I think the way I use the spectrum is I say that, okay, if somebody has heart failure, and I know they have heart failure, um, I'm going to push them to the very end of impaired relaxation. So I'm going to push them until that, that E wave and the A wave are basically at equal heights. And that's basically in between impaired relaxation and pseudonormal. And at that point, I know I've got them volume resuscitated because I'm pushing their preload up. I know I've got their, their, their LV preload as high as it's going to get before it's going to start distending their LV before they fall off the Franks or Starling curve. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. But I, I mean, uh, in, in the emergency department, I, I'll be honest, I love being able to quickly and easily look at the IVC and follow that as I'm resuscitating a patient. And I mean, do you, would you agree that this is, uh, this is really important in the ICU setting? Um, a little more than the emergency department? I would say that it's probably more important as, following, as far as following the really sick patients over time, yeah. But I would also say that I definitely use it as an assessment of preload in patients that are sick with bad hearts. So I guess I would just urge people not to just depend on the IVC in, in patients who 
who have heart failure at baseline. So what I'm saying is the, the patient who has a big dilated IVC with heart failure, their heart might be used to a little bit more preload than you or I, right? So a big dilated IVC does not necessarily mean that you've met their ideal preload yet. So diastolic function can tell you how much further can you push their preload. So if you basically, so say I look at somebody's IVC, they've got a big dilated IVC, it's not collapsing very much, and they're, they're hypotensive, and I'm wondering, should I give them fluid or should I give them pressors, right? Yeah. And then I take a look at their heart, and they've got impaired relaxation. That tells me I can probably push them a little bit further, and I can give them some more fluid and keep pushing them until that E wave reaches the height of the A wave, and I'm pushing them just to that tip of pseudonormal, right? And mm -hmm. at that point, I know that I've got their I've got their LV EDP up high enough that they should be responding well to the to the fluid. And if they're still hypotensive at that point, then that's when I'll start pressors. Great. Okay. Okay, Mike. So that's some pretty cool stuff, right? I know E divided by E prime e equals the pulmonary wedge pressure. That's awesome. Nice trick. And I think I can recognize at this point normal versus impaired versus pseudonormal versus restrictive. We've talked enough about it. You showed us enough examples. Great. But, dude, come on. Show me how this is going to affect the treatment of my next patient. Give me some real clinical examples. All right. So case one, 64-year-old male, shortness of breath, and lower extremity edema. History of hypertension and coronary artery disease. Taking a look at the heart, I think we see that the patient has a fairly... Uh, thick ventricle here. Um, they've got large atria, like really large atria, almost as big as the ventricles. Uh, and what do we think subjectively about the atria and the descent of the base, Matt? Good or not good? That does not look like it's descending well to me. Not descending well. Okay. Descending well. Descending well, okay. So here we take another look. Also, decent squeeze though. Mm. EF's pretty close to normal, huh? Yeah, just not getting much in there. Okay. Still pretty good squeeze. EF still pretty close to normal. Here, let's take a look at the mitral valve. So here's your mitral valve in, in, inflow. So um, about how high is your E wave there, Matt? 80. Yeah, and it's lower or greater than the A wave? It's lower. Okay, so the A wave is about 120, and the E wave is 80. All right, so where does that put us in our in our spectrum here? Uh, the second one. Impaired relaxation. Awesome. And here's our TDI, which confirms the same, E prime less than A prime. Here your E prime is a little bit low, and your A prime is around 8. So what's the diastology? Impaired relaxation, right? All right, case two. 74-year-old female with hypotension and urosepsis. She's got a reduced EF here and poor descent of the base. You do your mitral valve inflow, and what do you see there? Um, I see, you know what, I don't really see... An A wave is that? So I see an E wave. It looks like it's 180. And I and just to be fair, I have not seen these cases before, right? <laughs> you have not. No. All right. Sorry, I really am tipping. Yeah. This so <laughs> uh, you got a big A E wave, and I don't really see any A wave, so it makes me think it's really small. Okay. So is that restrictive? Uh, it might be. Let's take a look at the TDI and just make sure. All right, so your E wave, we said was, you said, I think it was 160 is what it was, but uh, yeah. in any case, your E prime, what does it look like it's there? Tiny, maybe, maybe five, four. Five. So, so this person's pulmonary wedge pressure is what? What was the first number you 160. said? 160. A lot. Yeah, 160 divided by four. So, does this patient need fluid or pressors? So, uh, this is a restrictive pattern. Pressors. Correct. Good guess. 50-50. So this patient has a really high preload and a really high pulmonary wedge pressure, right? They have plenty of volume going to their left ventricle to get the job done. So their problem is not volume, right? Right. So with this patient, okay, great. All right, case three, 35-year-old female with history of postpartum cardiomyopathy and dyspnea. So here we've got a parasternal long axis. See EF good, bad, normal. EF yeah, good and normal pretty, the same thing. Pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. Mitral valve inflow. Looks normal to me. Oh, looks greater than normal. normal. All right. So remember, she had what did she have? She had dyspnea and cardiomyopathy. Okay, so she's short of breath. So we're trying to figure out why she's short of breath. So mitral valve inflow was we decided pretty normal, and then we do our TDI, and or that is was it pseudo normal? Ah. Oh. 
E prime is less than A prime. Here. So here's a, a good example of a patient with a good systolic, a good systolic function. She's got shortness of breath. Turns out when you do the diastology, she's got pseudo normal. She's got increased left sided pressures, and she's actually suffering from acute heart failure exacerbation. Tricky, mm. eh? Very tricky. All right. Questions? Uh, no, we have another case. No, that was the last one. That was, is the patient fluid overloaded? The answer was yes. All right. So, I mean, I think I've, I've kind of given you a hard time throughout this as far as how is this going to help me? What patient is it going to make a difference? And I think you've, uh, I think you've answered that, especially with this last patient. So tell me, how would you treat this last patient differently? So they're short of breath initially, the postpartum patient. Mm-hmm. And we don't know what's going on. So, I, I mean, I would treat her like a heart failure. But before doing the the echo, mm -hmm. what I mean, I'm thinking... I don't know. I would have been working PE, up other causes of dyspnea. Yeah, I probably would have. if you just threw the ultrasound on there before you did that other stuff, then you could go down that treating as heart failure quickly, more quickly. Yep. I could suspect heart failure is my diagnosis. I mean, because it, pseudo -normal, a pseudonormal pattern is definitely abnormal and could definitely account for her dyspnea. Okay. I mean, I might you know back it up with a BNP and a chest X-ray just to make my cardiologist happy because I don't know if they trust me, but I'll do my best. Yeah. So this is so this is difficult stuff. I gotta be honest. Like going through it, I'm like really focused and trying to get this from you and trying to learn it. And I think the takeaway point for me is one: if my family member comes in with heart failure, I'd rather you take care of them <laughs> than me. Uh, but that actually inspires me that I need to learn this a little better. This is a way that I think. I mean, this is not the standard of care right now for emergency physicians to be looking at diastolic heart function on patients that come in short of breath. But you're an emergency physician. Uh, you know this stuff. You can do this stuff. And so... Not uh, only me, but there was also that study that we went over, right, with 140 patients where ED docs basically went through a four-hour didactic session to learn how to do this. And with better sensitivity than BNP or Boston heart failure criteria, yeah. diagnose people with heart failure. Well, so, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't require, you know, a month or a year of training. You know, it's, it's it definitely, definitely harder than the most of the stuff that we teach on this podcast, but it's, it's achievable. And more, even more convincing for me is if you know this stuff, I know you, you're not the smartest person. I mean, you can clearly do it probably in <laughs> half the time and two South, times better. South Carolina public education, yeah. I mean, yeah, they actually so, teach this in fifth grade in South Carolina. So I'm going to actually listen to this podcast multiple times. And I, I would, for any of you who are maybe uh, frustrated during this, you weren't getting it completely, that's what I would recommend. Go through this multiple times, learn this, and do some reading. Because I, I, I think it can affect patient care. So forgive me for a moment if I get slightly personal with you, but this case really affects me. My lovely wife just gave birth to our new daughter. And maybe it's just the new dad hormone stocking. But isn't this why you went into emergency medicine? I mean, okay, this may not be the standard of care in the ED to be able to diagnose diastolic heart function, but this is a skill that we can learn, and I, for one, don't want this new mother to walk into my ED and not be able to give her the absolute best state-of-the-art care. This case alone is enough for me to put the extra effort into really getting good at bedside echo. Wow, so that was a lot to take in. So, obviously, after one podcast on diastolic heart function, you're not going to have a PhD in diastology like Dr. Mike Mallon. But if you're like me, I mean, I kind of feel like maybe I got my GED or in diastology or something from this uh, little time that we've, we've, we've talked about it. Uh, and the most important thing is, you know what, I feel like I'm smarter at least. So if you feel the same way that you're smarter and that you would like more, I would encourage you to, to think about coming out and meeting us at Castle Fest in April. We're going to have a whole day of advanced echo and critical care, and you're going to learn a lot more of this stuff and be a lot smarter. So come on out. Uh, again, all the proceeds go to support the ASAP ultrasound section, and it's going to be an awesome time. Hope to see you then.
not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs, let us know how you feel about it.